Hey, thanks for joining everyone. Um, welcome to the first release of this year. Um, so the release 0.9.0. Um, so this release was is probably not too many, let's say, sexy features. However, I think it was a very good contribution and release uh, to provide a lot of kind of outstanding um, bug fixes and small kind of usability improvements, which I think should just uh, increase your enjoyment of using Thin Edge in general. So as like any of our releases, we have the releases formally on GitHub, so you can check out the release notes. I would really encourage everyone to do this uh, because that is really the, uh, the single source of truth. Saying, you know, what went in, and we try to put a bit of categories there. We're still playing around with a bit of the format, um, but we're trying to make it a little bit more kind of user consumable so you can see what parts, you know, you're interested in and really um, nail down, uh, look at them quickly. So today, because this is the whole list, um, we have a shorter time period. So I didn't want to go through and show every single kind of part because we've also shown um, a lot of this stuff, I think, in the last release, uh, not the release, but like the sprint demo that we did last year. Um, so in the uh, to reduce the time, we'll only be doing a bit of like the highlights. And I'll give a few kind of like notable mentions. So for the 0 0.9 release, we had a lot of um, kind of I want to say like cleanup things or compatibility stuff. So one of those big ones was the actual compatibility of the Debian package names. Uh, so this is the first kind of like influence um, that we've done to basically improve the, you know, how it plays with Debian and APT packaging. Um, so we changed basically the package names to use dashes instead of underscores. Not very interesting. However, um, it actually enables you to then host the Debian packages in a proper APT repository. And this is kind of the lead in work um, that we're getting quite close to actually having a APT repository, which is public that you can pull from to get the packages. Then kind of hand in hand with this feature, uh, we've also introduced automatic versioning. Um, so basically every time we merge a PR into main, it will generate a new package version which is actually really great if you want to build for yourself and you want the latest and greatest, uh, that you can just check out the project on main and then just do a build and it will automatically have an auto incremented using the Git kind of distance. Um, we'll also be generating a document that explains this. Um, so you can always have a unique version number. So there's no more kind of you've built, you know, from the latest main and you have like two versions which are running 0 0.9.0, but they're the same thing. Then we add a few uh, a new command like a tetch reconnect. Again, we'll have a demo on that, uh, but it's focusing on improving the developer interface. Then a few kind of uh, new features like configurable reboot, uh, which I'll go through, and also small changes like supporting the latest as like the latest um, static string uh, when you're trying to install software, um, that that gets translated to you know the latest available package. So it's kind of a bit of convenience factor stuff, especially for the Comilosity interface that you can then create actually packages in the Comilosity software management repository with the latest because that was actually requiring users to give a version so we can use the latest. Then we'll demo the log level control um, that we can now do from configuration, which makes it more convenient to adjust uh, the kind of levels which are shown in the um, uh, on the console and in journal D without having to actually edit then system D configuration files or service files. Um, and then these some kind of error improvements with the certificate kind of output to say, you know, why did it fail? Is it because your certificate is invalid? You maybe need to look at your CA uh, store or stuff like that. So it's trying to basically help the developers a little bit more and give more context. So one of the most, uh, so we have also included part of the release, a lot of um, uh, some bug fixes that we have and kind of the most notable from those um, are we had, I think about two or three tickets regarding the same thing. So if you've ever seen a 401 error, so basically, you know, permission denied um, when trying to either get a log file uh, from the devices or set or get configuration, uh, then that's um, now solved, uh, thankfully. Uh, so that was a big kind of showstopper because sometimes it would stop working after a few days. Um, and so that was a 
a source of a lot of annoyance, uh, which is now resolved. Uh, and then we also had some kind of periodic um, timeout connections regarding the MQT bridge. Uh, so they've also now been re uh, resolved because we've increased basically the timeout. I think it was like five seconds increased it uh, to something a little bit more kind of um, relaxed uh, to support different kind of um, settings, especially if you have kind of like slower networks or sometimes the device, um, maybe the DNS re resolving takes it a little bit longer for whatever reason. So it should now be a little bit more friendly for users. And one of the bigger ones, which we will have a demo on, is we fixed the plugin handling. So most notably for Comlocity users, uh, this is basically how you write a shell plugin um, that before it wasn't returning the actual output and it was just returning straight away and always sending the operation to successful. This has been fixed, uh, but Rina will show that um, a bit of a live demo to show why that is really important um, to show how to, and also as a good demo, you know, how to write your own kind of plugin. So moving on to the, uh, some of the demo stuff now. Um, so we start with the, we have a new command to, so before uh, with the Tej, you to like connect to a cloud or disconnect, you'd have the connect and disconnect. Uh, so if I just uh, use one of my, test devices, which just happens to be a Docker device. Uh, so classically, when you say maybe you connect to a device for the first time um, or you're having problems with it maybe and going, well, just I, I want to reset it just to be sure. And I don't want to do a reboot because that takes too long and I'm too lazy. Um, so classically, you would do this. So you would disconnect and then you go uh, connect, CFI, that or you would run that and then run the same, like I did this sometimes, go connect. But that was actually quite annoying to do. And I think there was enough use cases, especially for like debugging scenarios when you're not sure whether it's your network or something and you want to check maybe reconnecting might fix something um, that we now have a Tedge reconnect CAY. If it's not connected already, that's fine. It will just continue on saying, hey, you're not already, uh, you're disconnected currently, so it doesn't do another disconnect. Uh, so it's a really convenient function um, just to basically reset the MQTT bridge. Now, I'm not saying that you should always be running this because uh, if you have to continuously run this, um, it's usually a sign that maybe there's another kind of like um, misconfiguration or maybe there's some kind of communication problem. Um, so don't be scared of, you know, creating a, a ticket um, on GitHub uh, so we can look into specifically why you keep on the like why you keep on uh, running the reconnect command just so we can find what the root cause is and fix that at best. So like all the commands, like all of the Tedge commands, if you do like the Tedge, you get the normal help. Uh, so it's there and it's also available in the online documentation. So again, with also, you know, how do I use it? Usually you can just do, you know, forget an argument or, you know, use the classic dash H or dash dash help. So that's a, a nice convenience function. Then moving on to uh, some other small improvements. So um, currently, so before we have public Debian package hosting, um, the main way to install stuff is using the um, the getting started help script, right? So everyone's probably familiar with this. Um, so get finedge uh, underscore io dot sh, and that's pulled from the Git repository itself. So we can actually install, you know, the latest version using that. So that's documented on our website, um, but we've done a few tweaks to make it a little bit more um, user friendly and to try to cut out the uninteresting information. So we've actually improved a lot of the error output. So if I try to then specify a specific version that I want to install. So here I'm actually going to use a invalid version that does not exist. So this should not work, but we we'll kind of check out the output from this. So we it's trying to download it. And A, if you've noticed the output before, you're probably astounded how small it is now. Um, so before we used to be super verbose all the time and we would just kind of clutter things. So when everything went okay, you don't really want the verbose messaging.
or when something goes wrong, then you want the verbose messaging. So we've been a little bit smarter how we present the information. So when something unexpected happens, so here it couldn't download, um, you know, Tej, it will actually give you a printout what the reason was. It gives you even a bit of hint, hey, um, you know, maybe uh, you need to create a ticket if there's some kind of bug in the install script or um, we've specified a version that doesn't exist and we've told you, hey, try and install this and that doesn't. So you can even do like most um, terminals support kind of command click or, you know, clickable. That brings you exactly to the bug report. And in addition, it even prints out all of the information because that's the number one thing that we ask for in bug reports going, you know, what machine are you running on? What architecture? What version did you try to install? Uh, and can you also print the output? Um, so you can basically just copy paste all of this message um, to the output, and then that's uh, really helpful for us to help you. Um, so the idea is to really improve kind of like the feedback loop here um, so that we can fix problems then quickly. And also means that you have to do less work because you don't have to, you know, detail all the stuff that you wanted to, um, like your setup and stuff, it's all done for you. Obviously, you can always include additional information if it's interesting. Um, but if you have like, if you think there's more information that we should add there, then we're always open for feedback as well. So now moving on to one of kind of the features that we were included. So I think we did demo this maybe in the last sprint, uh, but I just want to kind of re-highlight it a little bit. Uh, so we're looking at the configurable restart command. So I'll use kind of our new, it's a work in progress at the moment, but our new integration testing setup. So I'm just gonna spawn a new kind of test device just so I can demo this going, this is a completely new device uh, and to see how that all kind of works together. So I'll let that just kind of spawn for the moment. So if you look at the documentation, we basically have the ability that we can control when you send a restart command to the device from the cloud, that you can configure what this command is actually doing. So in the normal instance, uh, it's actually quite important that, you know, it might not just be a shutdown minus R that you want to do. Like you might actually want to do Maybe I need to send a message to the cloud saying, hey, uh, I'm about to restart um, or maybe like do a general publishing on the local topic. So other components have a chance to say, oh, OK, I'm it's going down, so it will be unavailable for X minutes or whatever. Um, so it allows you to completely configure um, the whole setup. So if we just I'll show how it looks in the cloud first and then I'll go into the implementation. So this is my test device, which happens to be a Docker container. So we can see everything's you know running normal. I can see I'm on 0 0.9.0, so that's all good. Now I'm going to do a restart device. So when I click there, that will send an operation via the cloud. In this case, it happens to become velocity. And then the device will react and then send a response. So you can see the operation, it's in executing, but you can see here, I've set it up so I'm calling, uh, I actually create an event saying, hey, I'm about to reboot the device. Now, why is that important? Um, I really like the usage of events in general because it kind of adds a chronological um, order of, it's kind of like a log file, to be honest. So it's kind of nice to be able to understand what's going on with the device by these additional kind of notifications. So here we have two. So A, we have one that, you know, before it reboots, it sends an event saying, hey, I'm about to reboot. So I can kind of understand if I want to interact with this device after this point, I know it might not be the most responsive because it might be booting up still. And additionally, on my, uh, on my device, which is independent of the restart command, I just added a really simple systemd um, service, which just sends a, an event when the device boots up. It just sends an event saying, hey, I'm booted up. I'm on this kind of, you know, and a bit of information about the device. And, you know, boot time and all that kind of stuff. It's a little bit warped here because I'm using, you know, a Docker and it inherits from its host and all that kind of stuff. But if you're running on a real Raspberry Pi, you get, you know, the real kind of boot timestamp and stuff like that. But even here, I can tell from the timestamp in the cloud 
that it's booted up at this time. So it kind of gives me more information about the re, um, what's happening on the device. So I know what to expect when I interact with it, which is really, really important. So how am I doing this? So if we go back to my test setup. So I'm just going to, this is the container that got spawned, and I'm just going to attach a shell to it. And so I'm in my device now. So, you know, if I do a U name, cats, UTC, OS, I can see I'm running a, a Debian bullseye in there. So it's uh, not, you know, because it's inside the container. So the configuration is controlled by the Tej system toml file and under the system reboot command. You can specify each of, so you can put whatever command you want in there. So it has to be a binary, so you can't do echo, or if you had to do an echo, you'd have to do a bash, uh, et cetera. And then that will be called by Thin Edge itself when it receives this cloud notification. So it calls that script, and let's have a look how simple that script is. So all that's doing is it's running in a shell, so it's a shell script. Um, it's doing the publish on the topic, and I'm also just reusing the Tej MQTT pub, so I don't even need to install the Mosquito client, which is kind of handy for limiting the um, dependencies. Just sending a nice warning and sleeping for a, a period, five seconds. You could also do the, the sleep in the shutdown command if you wanted, but it's limited to minutes. Um, and then I'm calling the sudo shutdown minus r now. So that would then actually trigger, like in this case, the container restart, uh, but on real devices, then we'll do a proper system restart. So it's kind of flexible because you can call anything from it. Um, it you can really do anything you want from there. The number one caveat, which is just, hey, this might catch you out, um, is that because to an, to make sure that we do the calling of the commands in a secure manner, the command is actually called under the Tej user. To do the call, we're doing it under sudo. So because by default, sudo users, or at least our con default configuration, doesn't allow any commands to be run under Tej user, we have to actually specify them by using the sudo as file. So we can see here, like in my test setup, I've actually modified this, so that's this line, which then details what commands is Tej allowed to run when it's in sudo. So it doesn't, you know, allow anything because if you have sudo writes, that's that's root writes, and if you had this allow all commands, you could do anything you want, you know, reformat then the the root partition and everything. Um, so you can still be quite security conscious and saying I'm going to limit the damage that can be done here and saying I'm only so what I had to do was I added this on shutdown command, which is then referenced in here. So you can and I can just show how that looks. So it's kept that file. We can see so this is the allowed command. If your command that you call is not in this list, that means that the command will fail and the operation will actually get set to fail. So that's just a number one caveat that just be aware of that. Um, but that is really based on security. If for whatever reason, you know, you can disregard and say, I don't like having to specify all of my commands, you know, you could technically enter, um, you know, don't have a command based limitation and allow it for everything. However, our recommendation is definitely, unless if you're happy with that, just to specify the commands, because in the end, you should always limit, you know, what the Tech user can do, um, because it's great um, just way for security practices. Great. So that's all the stuff that I wanted to show uh, first up. So uh, now, Ruben, yeah, sure. One question. So which service was sending that, uh, that agent. message after the restart su succeeded? Ted agent. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm incorrect. I'll have to double check. However, I didn't want to focus on that because that's another point I want to say what's next. Um, okay. But maybe that, that fits in nicely now. Um, so we have a refactoring topic going on at the moment. Uh, and that's probably partial the reason why there weren't so many, you know, real showstopper features in this release. Um, however, the refactoring is very, very critical also for us as a team and to influence the speed of new development in the future. 
uh, and also make it a more kind of manageable code base and easier to kind of have nicer um, or easier implementation for more complex things like complex workflow things and caching and all this kind of wonderful stuff. Um, part of that is basically in the future, we're still deciding exactly how, but you will definitely have a decrease of number of independent services. So for example, at the moment we have quite a lot of services. So I think we have, you know, uh, status, we have Tedge agent, and then CY log plugin, configuration plugin, XXXX. So we're looking at consolidating all of these services. I won't say into one, but considerably less services. Um, so I think that question then in the future will be easy to answer. It's not like where is this actually getting executed from? It'll be quite clear going, you know, the, the core kind of daemon, and it's being run by that, full stop. Not saying that we won't have more than one service because I think the comulosity related stuff is something great which exists at its own service, but then maybe something more logical like grouping all of the comulosity related plugins into one daemon or binary makes sense or makes more sense, uh, which also then has a positive influence on kind of maintenance of packages, uh, both for developers and the users, because less packages that you have to kind of list to install and less components. Um, and it makes it a little bit more um, just easier for the users to kind of interact with and answer what is doing what, um, because, you know, we've halved the number of different services. Yeah, so more than the which service was emitting it, I was more interested in whether that logic is also pluggable, like that uh, pluggable script that you had shown. So uh, that's what I wanted to know. Uh, what kind of event it creates, like can I update? Uh, the data that's there, that event and stuff like that. But I'm assuming that it's it, a fixed event in a predefined format and. I don't know, uh, no, no, like that event stuff was my <laughs> custom shutdown script. So I just said what I wanted to put in there. So. And not the not the waiting for shutting down, the thing that came after the, after the device boot, uh, rebooted. So that yeah. fancy message with the. Oh, that's, that's your custom logic. Okay. Yeah, that's that's also a custom. Uh, let's hope I got that right. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, I can also just show that. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So it's not part of the. Yeah, exactly. It's not part of it. It's just kind of because I personally like seeing when a device comes up and be notified that it's come up, because it's obviously not when it comes up, which is interesting. It's when it doesn't come up, which is the more interesting one. So it's kind of like. I know when it behaves and then by having like the shutdown event and startup event, you then get an idea. How long does it take to reboot the device? Which depending on kind of what devices you're interacting with could be wildly different, especially if you're operating on older devices and and so containers are going to be a lot quicker generally uh, rather than a real kind of Raspberry Pi. So you're probably talking about one to two minutes kind of reboot time instead of, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. Yep. So that's this custom logic that I added in also for demonstration purposes, but also to reiterate how easy it is to do this stuff. And that's why we have these topics and really utilizing like the Tej MQGT pub is super, super useful because you can do anything you want. And then this is all about the customization. We're providing the building blocks that you guys can use. So, you know, whether it's fulfilling different customers requirements or just your own kind of requirements, uh, you can really customize it to whatever you want. So. So that's a simple script that I wrote. And you can actually use any kind of UTF-8 characters. So I like using that for kind of to be more, um, you know, in your face to go, ah, okay, it's green, everything's good. If it's red, you know, bad and, and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, so then moving on to the next topic, we want to look at the uh, the plugin output handling. Uh, so for that, I'll hand over to Rina. Yeah, thanks, Ruben. Then I'm going to share my screen. Is it a second? Okay, this one. So I hope I'm sharing the right screen. Um, Today, uh, what I want to demo is an enhancement of how we handle the custom supported operations. Uh, 
so the feature, so as I said, enhancement, so the feature itself already existed uh, since a long time ago. So I'm not sure if everybody is already familiar with that feature itself. So first, let me explain very briefly uh, what is the feature itself. Um, so to have some function like uh, supporting software management, firmware, set by shell, uh, apparently, so the device needs to declare the supported operations to Kimberosity. And uh, already thing it offers a scheme. So how to declare the supported operations for your sales device. So I'm showing the, our user guide. So if you want to see this, you can go to the user documentation tutorials. This this one supported operations management for Kimberosity IoT. And so what we say is if you have a file uh, name the supported operation that you want to declare to Kimerosity uh, under this ETC test operation CHY, and then CH is going to declare it automatically. So there are two patterns. You can create either an empty file with the name of operations, or you create a file and you can have the content. So the content uh, format is like this. So the topic is that you want to listen, and the message is a smart list message ID, and the command is a callback. So in this example, uh, what is going to happen is when you, uh, when a smart list message uh, with a message ID 511 uh, is received on CTSDS topic uh, on your CTS device, then uh, CNS will trigger uh, an executable uh, specified uh, in this path, etc. Touch operations command. And so, actually, the enhancement of 0 0.9.0 release is exactly so. How to address uh, this uh, callback command? Uh, okay, so. This is the same so the script as in our documentation. So previously, uh, when a message is received, so apparently so we execute the command, uh, but uh, from the re very early release, uh, we did, so CS didn't send the operation status update, like executing successful failure. And I think previously this 0 0.8, we start sending uh, the command is now executing and successful or failure. Uh, but uh, that implementation was not so precise. So that's why on the 0 0.9.0 release, we enhanced that part. So, uh, sorry. So, in short, now with 0 0.9 release, uh this command that you give to uh that path uh doesn't have to publish the status change message to say it twice. so you don't need to uh, handle or that command needs to send uh, executing uh, or successful failure this one uh will be done by thing and also depending on the exit code of the command that you gave, uh, CNH will send the status update message with the output of executed command. So that means if the uh, command exit with zero, then it will be considered oh, this command uh, is uh, finished uh, successfully. And then the output on SD the out uh, will be also sent uh, to Kimerosity with a smart rest message 503. And if the command exit with non-zero code, uh, then this command uh, execution is considered as failed. And in that case, the output on STD error uh, will be sent to Kimerosity by the smart rest 502. That means the status is failed. So this is uh, the explanation that I'm going to show the real demo. So first I would I'd like to show you very easy one. 
So my device is already connected to Cumulosity tenant, and I have a CHY command under ETC that's Operation CHY. And uh, yep. Yeah. So this one, uh, when the my device is when my device this is five one one, uh, then uh, it's going to trigger uh, executable located in etc touch operations command sh. So oh, sorry, I didn't want to change it. And then command sh. What I have. So I have just two echo. One is uh, to std out. The second one is std error. So first, I want to show you the successful pattern. So this one will exit zero in any case. Then, yeah, let's create just some operation. Just I send a test. Oh, ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, because I changed, I need to restart the service of Mapper. Okay. Sorry, I will do again. Then now, successful. So, okay, as I show you here. So with this command sh, so std in is this message goes to std out, and then you can see um, this text as a response. And since this command exits with zero, so the status is successful. And then for failure case, just change this one. I don't need to restart in this case, I guess. Sorry. Um, okay, then test. Yep. Yeah, then uh, failure reason uh, shows uh, the text on STD error. So this is uh, the logical part what we enhanced, then now I want to show you the practical example. So with the shell. So uh, then I have another script. Okay. Uh, then this command handler is uh, a little bit better. So if I, for example, run echo hello, then it will show, it will execute exactly echo hello. So better to see it, easier to understand. So now echo hello. Then Yes, the response is exactly hello. Yeah, and uh, and also it supports multiple line as well. Echo hello, echo word. Oops. Yep. Then, yes, it's the out is hello word. And if I run something doesn't exist, this file where directory doesn't exist apparently and in that case of course that the execution failed and you can see the failure isn't uh, here so that's all that i can share this time yeah so the the failure reason is actually then you can control it however you want uh, within the script yourself um, so you you can put it put I think the first line is the last standard error message. Um, so in this script example, like the command handler, because we were basically just proxying the you know the requested commands to a bash shell and doing that there, uh, but we added a bit of kind of our own custom handling of the standard error. But you can do it however you want. Um, but the key thing is we've used Linux principles here. 
that you know a non-zero exit code means something went wrong. Uh, so we haven't reinvented the wheel there. So anyone familiar with kind of Linux standards uh, and kind of normal conventions uh, should feel right at home. So yeah, thanks, Rena, for the good presentation. And so because we have that shell interface, that just opens up everything for you, which is really nice because you can actually do it, use it to help debug devices as well. Um, so obviously, because the MQT um, payload size is limited, uh, so we can't do you know above sixteen thousand five hundred something characters, um, but you can still get a lot of useful content from it. So moving over there, so thanks, Rina. Uh, moving over to the next presenter, uh, Pradeep, which will give an overview of the health messages on start and stopping of services. Thanks, Ruben. Uh... Let me share my screen. Yeah, hope you can see my screen. Um, yeah, um, in the earlier version, we had this uh, health. We were publishing health check messages, um, status messages. Basically, uh, these messages were sent on request basis, actually, from any of these uh, thin edge services. So uh, in this version, what we did is like um, Whenever a, a service is ready actually to serve the request or to fully operational uh, after initializing everything and uh, ready for uh, operation. So uh, by default, it sends a health message uh, telling that it's ready or it's up. Um, whenever it goes down, uh, it will send a health status as down. So these uh, messages are sent over MQTT topics. Uh, every service has its own uh, health uh, MQTT topic. On that, it will actually uh, send these health status. So um, the health status for up um, is done um, over the TEDGE health. For example, for the mapper, TEDGE uh, mapper C8Y, it will be like TEDGE mapper C8Y, the service name here. So it will send the PID status and the time when it actually uh, sent that uh, status message. Uh, for the stop, um, it will send just the PID and the status is down. Um, here we cannot send the time because uh, this is a, uh, we, we actually leverage a last will message uh, feature from MQTT broker. So we can't add the time because this has to be upfront registered with the broker. Whenever a service goes down, the, basically the connection goes down, um, the broker will actually send this message on behalf of the service which go which goes down actually so that's why we can't at the time here uh, only the status so um the use cases uh, of this one is like um one can use these status messages for monitoring the health of the services or you can uh, anybody can write their own logic on top of these health status messages um they can subscribe to these topics uh, and they can write their own logic. To show the demo, um, for example, just disconnect. Let me subscribe for all the messages here. See, um, now those are the old messages. Uh, if I connect now back, obviously it will go down. Takes a while to boot. See, um, the agent has come up, so agent pushed its status, uh, telling that it's up. Uh, same way, the mapper is also um, pushed his status, telling that it's up at this point in time. So if I stop, So I stopped the C8Y mapper, so it sent a down status message. 
So it's the same with uh, all the other uh, thin ed daemons. It could be like uh, the plugins, uh, CHY configuration plugin or log plugin or agent or collect dmapper. Yeah, um, the same thing. Yeah, uh, this is all I had to show. Um, if you have any questions? No, doesn't sound like it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Pradeep. So then from the next section is, you know, what's next for Thin Edge? Uh, so I've already discussed uh, the points about, you know, package um, hosting um, that we've made one step forward to making this possible. We found a potential cloud hoster provider, which also um, provides a very generous OSS offering. Um, so we're looking to finalize that in the next uh, week or two. I was working on the PR yesterday to, you know, update all the workflows uh, and also the topics on refactoring, which is, uh, I cannot stress enough, really, really important for us. Uh, and also for in the end, um, it's going to mean we can implement things and more complex things, possibly, you know, device profile stuff um, quicker and easier and have more manageable code. Then we're also working on some of um, maybe not some features, but like the automation of the integration testing and also looking at how we can the library support that we do there, how can then that be utilized by other plugin writers to then sufficiently test your plugins with Finage. So the idea is that we can um, basically enable plugin writers to easily write integration tests. Um, so using a Python based framework. Um, so that's we're wanting to use it ourselves first, and then before then we can give it to people uh, like plugin writers. Uh, then for the features we're looking at, um, or we're currently implementing child device support for the firmware operation. Now I must stress this is for child devices at the moment um, because we had a direct uh, requirement um, for a potential customer. And so we wanted to fulfill that, and that's something that um, we're looking to drop in the next two weeks. And also we were wanting to work on the server status support within Commolocity um, so that you use, I think, the feature that was brought in 1014 Commolocity, where you can actually see the status of different services within the UI. Um, so we're looking to implement that um, definitely for the next re release. But in general, I'll just quickly um, share my screen again. In general, if you're looking for um, basically what is on the immediate, like, you know, what's coming in the next release, um, you can have a look at the, so I want to get my, can't see anything there. If you look at the milestones, um, so we haven't, so I don't want to use this as a full planning kind of feature. Um, but it's good to see what's in the upcoming release. And, you know, what is the blocker? Um, I need to say that to done. Um, so the upcoming release will be 0 0.10, so the next one. Um, so I've been marking some kind of tickets when it's clear, yes, this is definitely focused, we'll be delivering this. Then um, you can kind of use that as a gauge of what we have then actively planned. Uh, we're still working on the more public kind of roadmap, which looks at, you know, what are we doing in the next year? Um, so we can better communicate kind of the goals of Thin Edge. And then also have an additional one uh, which has a slightly larger outlook or a longer outlook. So that concludes the demo for today. So thanks everyone for listening. Um, I guess I would open up to any additional questions uh, that anyone had uh, at the moment about the image or the release or just general questions. And yeah, there's no open questions on the chat. So just to read the chat for there was a discussion about the command kind of interface. Uh, so it was a bit of back and forth there uh, because I think that's a really, really useful feature, which I can't stress that enough. I use it uh, a lot for my things and debugging stuff. It's quite powerful. Um, so if there's no questions then. Thanks everyone for attending today and see. Oh, wait, so there's a question coming in. Is there an automatic timeout uh, option for operations? Rena, I'll need your assistance. I have a feeling if there isn't, we definitely need it. Um, I'm. Do we have an automatic setting? Uh, I don't think so. No. 
yeah, so we definitely will be adding that because I think that's very, very important um, to basically reduce, you know, things that hang forever. Or if you, I think the classic one is if you do a curl command, I think the default curl doesn't have a timeout or, or something, or maybe some languages like a Python request library. If you do a get that doesn't have a default timeout, so watch out there for production stuff. Um, so that would definitely make sense putting a timeout there. Um, and then again, like any timeout, you know, we won't be able to guess a, a sensible one for everyone, so it will be configurable. So I'll, I think after this meeting, I'll create a ticket for that, definitely. Because I think the general concepts so are a lot of the timeout operations. Um, so for example, we have timeout um, interactions for child devices. So when for the configuration management plugin, which was released last um, 0 0.8.0, um, if the child device isn't responding after X kind of minutes, seconds or whatever, uh, it will say, ah, OK, I can't trust you. You're maybe not available at the moment and sets the operation to failed. So we would do uh, look at implementing a similar strategy basically for any external communication. So especially plugin communication, because we want to be able to protect um, so that the plugin can be doesn't have to worry about that stuff. Um, obviously, you can do that yourself, um, but then you kind of have to you know, do a nested script call and all that kind of stuff, which that makes it more effort on your side, which we can definitely take over. OK, uh, like anything, you can always uh, hit us up, um, hit us up on our Discord channel and raise a ticket on GitHub, uh, and then we'll respond to any kind of additional questions. Eric, then thanks for your time and see you next time.